During our webinar series, Sanctuary and the Global Migration Regime, we are discussing the creation of places of safety that keep people alive, that empower and that expose the racist divisions the migration regimes rely on. From crossing the borders in the first webinar, during the asylum procedures in the second, and when facing deportation, that's tonight or today. This Friday, on June 18th, we will come together and discuss in more depth about those questions raised during the first three webinars. If today is the first one you are joining, you are also very welcome uh, to come and join us on Friday. There we will also have a chance to get to know each other a little. And as the setting of this Zoom webinar tonight or today is quite anonymous for participants, we invite you to share your name if you want organization and where you're located through the chat. And this way we can all at least get an idea of who is here with us today. Today's event is a cooperation between the Fellowship of Reconciliation USA and Asyl in der Kirche, the German Sanctuary Movement Office. We are grateful for the generous support of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, both Berlin and New York office that made these international series possible. Many thanks to Sarah and Josephine, who are our interpreters today. And also thank you, Susan and Ethan from Fellowship of Reconciliation USA for supporting us today behind the scenes technically. During the webinar, you are welcome to send questions through the Q&A and we will raise as many of them as possible today. Thanks again for being here. And now I pass the word to you, Noor. All right, thank you so much, uh, Ulrike, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you all for joining us and being here today. Um, it's my pleasure to be moderating this third and final panel discussion today on what it means to create safe, uh, spaces of safety from deportation and build transformative alliances with three fantastic speakers who will guide us in a conversation about sanctuary at the intersection of racial justice and collective liberation. Um, I know they each have a lot to say about the topic of sanctuary, saviorism, coloniality, and the reproduction or subversion of racial divisions and immigration justice struggles with an incredible and unique set of experiences and expertise. Um, our first speaker, Adam Bahar, was a part of a group of refugees who occupied Oranienplatz Square in Berlin from uh, 2012 to 2014 and later became a guest in sanctuary in a Berlin church. He's been an activist at advocating for refugee rights for years, and Adam is currently working with Lokal EV, an organization for political education from an anti-racist and post-colonial approach. Um, we'll start with Adam, but I do want to just introduce the next two speakers and then I I'll return to Adam for um, opening remarks. Um, so our second speaker is Reverend Ann Dunlap. Uh, she is the faith organizing coordinator for Showing Up for Racial Justice or Surge, a national network of groups and individuals working to undermine white supremacy and to work for racial justice. Through community organizing, mobilizing, and education, Surge moves white people to act as part of a multiracial majority for justice with passion and accountability. Anne co-founded the Denford CO Sanctuary Coalition and was brought into justice work through the sanctuary movement in the US in the 1980s. Um, our third speaker, Ravi Raghbir, is a community activist with the New Sanctuary Coalition New York, NSC, a multi-faith immigrant-led organization that creates support systems for and empowers those navigating the immigration system. NSC's grassroots programs are designed to shine a light on and disrupt the systems that criminalize immigrants' existence. Core programs include the Pro Se Immigration Clinic, Accompaniment, Anti-Detention, and Community Organizing and Advocacy. So thank you for joining us today, both panelists and participants. Um, I'd love to start our conversation off by asking each of you to speak a little bit more about your racial justice work and, and specifically what sanctuary means to you um, in the context of that work. So if possible, I would love to start with you, Adam. Um, thank you so much, Ferris, for the giving us the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm happy to uh, share with you a little bit uh, of my experience um, of, about this topic and about the topic of migrations um, um, in, in, in whole um, 
system or how I, I, I live it and feel it in Germany. Um, I was, as you say before, I was part of uh, one movement was took place 2012 in Berlin. Um, uh, we had uh, to organize march from uh, a city in Western Germany to the capital of this, uh, Berlin to, to protest. Uh, the unhuman um, situation was uh, refugee uh, was so, so um, living in, and they are uh, pushed to live in that uh, situation. Um, we had this uh, long movement. We was working with different others, people also. And one part of our work was also work with Jerich Asylum um, as kind of uh, support. And then uh, me myself, I, I. I had to live in Jared Asylum for some times uh, to break my uh, deportation uh, uh, was to call uh, Dublin to deportation in Europe. They have some kind of uh, law that um, when you ask asylum in the first uh, country, you have to go back to it. And that was my case. I'm supposed to do that. Uh, but I think uh, the important uh, things that to say um, that movement uh, was taking place 2012. Um, it was moved a lot uh, the discussion in, in Germany about refugees and migrants uh, and their rights. And um, still until now, um, part of it is um, still the structure from that 2012 until now, part of it still exists. And um, we had a long struggle uh, about it, how to leave it exist. But um, I think we can come um, later to talk about this in details. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Ed. Um, we'll certainly return to a lot of those themes um, very soon. I was wondering if we could go now to Anne. Thank you so much, Noor. Um, and it's my pleasure and honor to be joining with all of you today. Um, I want to first say uh, that I live on um, what are the uh, lands of the Haudenosaunee and Erie peoples, the indigenous peoples of what is currently and colonially called Buffalo, New York. And I want to name that because of the role that colonization um, plays in, uh, in global migration. The, the forces that uh, removed indigenous peoples from their lands are the same forces that are driving people to leave their homes, to seek, seek sanctuary, to seek asylum, um, elsewhere. So it feels important. I always try to do that, but it feels important to name that for the context of the conversation that we're ha having also um, as well today. Sanctuary for me um, means more than just a building where people can be safe from deportation, because what I learned working with um, undocumented folks resisting uh, deportation um, in Denver, Colorado, where I used to live, uh, is that you may be safe from deportation inside a church building, but it may not actually be a sanctuary. And so um, the undocumented uh, immigrants, refugees, we might say from global capitalism, from colonization, um, we just try to call them undocumented as if they were less than human. They taught me that sanctuary is really about building a world where nobody actually has to leave home to seek safety. How do we build a world where everyone is actually safe, where, where every place is actually a sanctuary? So how do we be sanctuary? How do we be safety to one another and dismantle the systems both within our churches and within our governments and beyond that actually prevent that from happening? So I'm really grateful um, to the folks that I uh, worked with in Denver, particularly Jeanette Bisquerra, with whom I co-founded the, the Denver Sanctuary Coalition, um, who's been fighting her deportation case since 2009. Um, and also to the many folks who I got to know who were fleeing the civil wars um, from in Central America in the 80s when I first was called into justice work, if you will, um, and recognizing a world that was not safe and how our government in the United States contributed to that deep lack of safety for so many people. So again, my gratitude for, for being able to be here today and share, share some of that knowledge and experience with, with us. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Anne. Um, I'm really excited to get more into a lot of what you shared today in our discussion. Um, Ravi, could we turn to you next? Sure. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me and for um, this space because it is important for us to understand that it is not just about someone having to wanted to come to any particular country, whether it's in Germany or US or England or France or whatever, because um, the, and I refer to it as why do we need to leave, right? If you create a safe space where people are, many people will not need to leave. Um, but migration is a natural process. There is no one in this world who has not migrated. And I always use the example of, think about it. Do you still live in your parents' home? If you do not, it means you have migrated from one home to another home, right? That's how simple it is. Um, but I have been fighting my deportation since 2006. I spent two years in immigration detention. I have been, I have had to report at one time three of three times a week to a deportation officer, which means that every time I go into to see into federal building, and I'm talking about particularly in New York City, every time I went in to see a deportation officer, it meant that I may not come back out. It meant that I will not be, be seeing any family or friends. And that was three times a week. And the trauma of that. Um, is very evident. It, it, it seeps into it, but it becomes part of your DNA. And many of our undocumented um, people or community um, suffer with PTSD. And people will say, you know, when you ask them what is PTSD, they will say post-traumatic stress syndrome. It is not post. We, we, we are still living in that. So it's perpetual, right? Perpetual trauma. And, and that doesn't go away until... And even when we have, you know, when someone says, okay, you're going to get your green card, and until you have that green card in your hand, you still don't believe it. You still never believe it because you do not trust the system that is, that is created to destroy you. Immigration is built upon a racist policy. It is based upon uh, 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 economic injustice. It is based upon the color of your skin. And let us understand that, you know, we will get into the details of why why that is happening, so that it is not about what I do, but it is about who I am. And there should be no system like that. So what is sanctuary to me? Sanctuary to me, as many have said, and I'm going to be short about this because we all know that sanctuary is a safe space, right? But we, we should not only need to have a safe space among four walls. What we need to do is we need to start pushing back against the system. We should not wait for the system to tell us hey, it is okay for you to come out or it is okay. We need to push the system at every turn at that until we are able to, to, to make the change that we need to make, uh, we, have to, we have to continue to be in their face. Um, and the reason I, the, uh, the, because that is how you engage the community because I alone cannot win this fight. Adam cannot win this fight, right? We work, with, we work with communities, we work with people, and it's only by working together that we start changing the dynamic of, of the color of the skin and who we are, no? Yeah, that, that's so fantastic. Thank you all for that really powerful introduction. Um, I just wanna say very briefly, um, for those of you who came a little bit later to the discussion, um, if you need translation by any chance, we do have uh, an interpretation feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So I just wanna flag that for folks who might've um, trickled in a little bit later. Um, you know, I'm very, very, um, touched and encouraged by this idea of sanctuary being fundamentally about building a world in which no one needs to leave home. I think sanctuary is very often, you know, invoked in ways that reproduce the very inequalities that create migration in the first place. Certain, you know, um, global North countries are seen as having the privilege of sheltering people. Certain institutions in those countries are given the privilege to then speak back to law enforcement in ways that others are not. We see this very much in Germany currently with the church asylum, you know, practice. Churches have the ability to shelter people. You know, mosque asylum is 
is currently not something that is a state sanctioned practice. And so, you know, you enter a series of really difficult tensions and paradoxes when you both want to envision a world in which nobody has to leave home, envision a world in which we are all radically on the same terrain to offer one another sanctuary, to be ourselves in a place where nobody has to go elsewhere in order to seek sanctuary, but at the same time having to work within really racist colonial institutions in which strategic alliances are necessary with people who, you know, we might even resent having to be, um, you know, um, reliant upon. And so in that vein, I want each of you to speak a little bit more about this tension. How do you create strategic alliances with people who and institutions who've been designated power unfairly because of the kind of colonial history of our kind of our, our world, um, how do you build strategic alliances while also emphasizing that that sense of we need to create a transformative future? How do those alliances become transformative um, in the service of equity and justice? And so um, I think uh, I'd like to start with Adam, um, if you'd be willing to speak to that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you um, so much for, um, I think already um, some part of the things that uh, you say, I think it is important uh, to to put uh, two line in it and make it so clear for our discussion today, because I think uh, Paris, uh, when we talk about um, migration and then talk about a uh, judge asylum, uh, for me it's important that to not forget uh, um, how, which kind of um, image that uh, being put there about refugees and, and migrants. For me, it's this image of uh, having to protect these people, how to keep these people safe. I, I'm, this is this one thing that I think uh, we have to um, question for is uh, what is what is mean that what is what we mean also by by safe space yeah um, for me safe safe space uh, cannot be also under uh, some kind of um, circumstances we where people cannot choose by themselves uh, where to can go to uh, live in judge asylum or not uh, this is important uh, to say because um, at least in Germany as a country I live now uh, to get uh, judge asylum is not something easy everyone have access to uh, and that bring us to uh, to the point of uh, how judge asylum also working with the system hand of hand to choose some kind of example of good integrated uh, people to save them and and let the other um, uh, this this one things but i think the more important also uh, to question uh, how many people die in the sea trying to cross to come uh, to Europe or to other country where we don't see that that life of people also is still important to save. I mean, uh, uh, judge can play a big role in this. And I think this is important, at least in the context of, of, of us here in, in Europe and in, in Germany, uh, to figure out and discuss about it. Because um, for me, people taking a boat and coming, uh, that, that something don't have to uh, be uh, put together an image of people need to be safe and need to uh, to protect them because for me uh, the first uh, people who took boat or took a ship and go somewhere else is a white colonial um, man who go uh, to different kind of places uh, in in Africa or other places um, in, in in Latin America to 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 colonize people in the same idea of also. Uh, um, with giving them the light, bring them the light and bring them a uh, better life. I mean, this is something that is also important in this um, context to think about it and see uh, how it is going in, in, in the asylum, uh, at least, as I say, in, in, in Germany. Um, more important things, I think, uh, also have, I have to, to say it here because uh, you talk about how to build on a um, kind of... Um, not works and work together. I think for me, the judge asylum itself, the idea I see it in the beginning was coming from a community uh, for, of, of migrants and refugees because I, 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 leave, I leave that and I see it because uh, in, in Germany, for example, when police come and try to uh, catch some, someone and deport him back, uh, the people try to protect uh, this person by themselves and they try to change the room. See, in, in Germany, for example, when refugees live all in one shelter, uh, the people do this idea of like um, changing the room of this person who needs to be uh, deported to live in the other 
room where the police cannot uh, took him because then he come and then they don't found him, but he's still in the place. And that was for me a kind of um, how a self-organized safe space and how the refugees by themselves try to create safe space where you don't have any um, um, biggest rule to, to, to accept to get in. Uh, like it's a space for everyone where everyone can feel feel safe and be protected by the people by themselves. I think uh, this is something um, I, I also leave it in Germany. Also in Germany, it was the idea of uh, blocking uh, the deportation from the refugees by themselves and different other people who support uh, non-deportations uh, idea. This was also happening in Germany in the last years where uh, bigger movement was being created uh, in the same way where people uh, trying to do this. The other, the other also example, I think it's also important in the context of Germany to, to say again, also there is, was like kind of uh, burger and asyl, they call them, like um, citizens. Uh, uh, this is the same idea of Czech asylum, but it was also in the last year of Germany. In, in Germany, in the last years, it also exists where um, citizens by, them, by themselves saying, okay, I have a space in my home and I will try to give um, this space for someone who is um, uh, threatened by deportation and, and, and trying to give the same kind of idea what Sierra Asylum do. And this is uh, show how is this three uh, kind of different of way uh, is also building alliance in the way of like um, um, citizen by themselves try to do that. Uh, or the refugees by themselves. And I think that is the more important uh, to see the refugees by themselves. Um, I think that the discussion then is also can go uh, to see um, what all this bring us, because as you say, um, not the only uh, people have the power to do that is a judge. And, and this is also bring us to, to discuss about uh, is Christian tomb is the only religion who can have this uh, power to save other people, what about Islam, what about Buzi, and what about others, um, religions and so on. At least it's in Germany, it is not allowed in Moscow to do that. But I think um, this kind of, of, of discussion is also, for me, at least in the context of German, bring us to discuss about um, uh, anti-Muslim uh, or the anti-Muslim racism, who is um, really, in Europe, this is really a um, big topic to discuss about it. Um, but um, I will come to that later. Yeah, we'll solve it then. Yeah, thank you so much, Adam. Um, I'm wondering, um, Anne, would you like to respond directly to that? Yes, thank you so much, Anna. Um, I think one of the, the points that I hear you lifting up out of this is, is the importance of the impacted people to have agency in this process as, as one way of counteracting um, the, the privilege, if, if you will, that um, churches and faith communities have within these systems. Um, this is also what I have learned uh, working in the sanctuary movement in the 80s and 90s and then uh, in the Sanctuary Coalition in, in Denver that the, the importance of, of agency of, uh, a, I don't wanna say allowing, but um, there has to be space for, for the impacted folks to be able to self-organize, to be able to make decisions about their lives. Um, and to, for those of us who are, who are white to, to actually pay attention to what we're being told. Um, and to have full transparency about how we're making decisions and even making sure that impacted folks have leadership in, in how decisions get made, especially about money, not only about money, but including about money. I think I'm thinking also about the, in the United States situation, um, it's a much more tenuous relationship that, that, that sanctuary congregations and here, not only Christian churches can be uh, can declare themselves a sanctuary church, but but also synagogues and other spaces. Although it is predominantly um, Christian churches, it's a tenuous relationship with the government because what we what happened was in the '80s in the sanctuary movement, where where people were fleeing from Central America 
and being given sanctuary in churches um, and congregations in the United States and a whole network of getting people to safety, getting refugees to safety, even all the way to Canada, the government infiltrated those spaces. Um, they infiltrated Bible studies, they infiltrated church services, and there was a huge backlash against that after that happened. Um, and so uh, the um, immigration offices said, okay, we, we won't do that anymore. And, um, and yet, that's only their word. There's not actually any kind of legal law thing that says that Immigration and Customs Enforcement cannot by law go into a church and take somebody out. We're sort of depending on them to be honorable to their word. And in our previous administration, whose, whose name I will not utter, um, we saw them pushing that, the limit of that. Um, we, we saw that happening. And I was actually shocked that they didn't actually come and drag somebody out at some point that that didn't happen. But that points to the kind of tenuousness of that relationship that's a little bit different and yet also a privileged relationship. Okay, we won't touch the churches because it's mostly churches that people are imagining that this happens in Christian churches, um, but we can go anywhere else that we want to. And that's what, what they do. And so it, it's paramount for congregations to really understand that dynamic and to understand that in some ways we're, we're kind of being played by the government and to do as much as possible to assure that, that the folks who are, who are living in our, in our buildings um, have as much agency and that there's as much transparency as possible. And in addition to that, if we are not also organized to, uh, to change the systemic structures then all we're, all we're doing is a kind of very hyper individualized, well, we saved this one person, but the structure itself is gonna continue to produce the conditions in which people need to flee. So if the, that kind of, you know, the organizing in addition to the housing has to go hand in hand. So we're organizing for economic justice, we're organizing to abolish the police because policing is one of the, main ways that folks end up into deportation proceedings in the United States. This is perhaps true in other places as well. Um, you know, working to, to undo the conditions of, of colonization, that organizing has to go on side by side because otherwise we're just replicating the conditions of colonization and that's not actually creating the safe world that we are longing for. Fantastic. Um, I want to give uh, Ravi a chance to jump in. Yes. Um, so we have to always start with the, the knowledge that you're not going to change in certain people's minds. I'm talking about the white supremacists, the Nazis, the Golden Dawns. They are not going to change their minds. And by the way, am I allowed to curse on this? Because I get really angry sometimes and I say some mess up. Well, yes, no. No? Okay, I wouldn't curse. There's a bunch of faith leaders on this, so they probably wouldn't be happy. Um, uh, but, you, so, let's understand, we, we are not, I'm not saying ignore them, I'm not saying don't talk to them, but don't be disappointed when, we, when they continue with their hate, right? They're full of hate. That's not going to change. Um, and our job is to plant, as we, as we say in faith communities, plant the seed. We don't have to harvest it. Uh, but, there is a lot of people who have misinformation who are not thinking through the processes and who will be understanding if we actually connect them to the issues. So the way we create alliances is by relationship. The first thing we need to understand is relationship. So um, relationship first, but then there's a power structure, right? There's a, there's a, the way, uh, a structure of um, influences. And obviously in the United States and everywhere else, it always comes down to legislation or the laws. So we have to influence the law itself, no matter where we are. But how do we do that? And we can always say, well, you know, we need to reach out to the media and we need to reach out to elected officials as if they will save us. No, they are not going to save us. What we need to do is we need to have the community, the community create this space, this environment that we are in, easily moving the elected officials into a space where they have to come to us rather than we pushing it, right? 
they have to move to us. And therefore, once we have moved them, we are not going to move into the direction of legislation that will create a, a safe environment. So in New York City, um, you know, we, we, have, we have had a number of sanctuary, people living in, in physical sanctuary, but we have never wanted to do that. Because it, it, I, as I said, I was in detention for two years. It is much more difficult for me to stay in sanctuary in a church than was to be in detention. You know why? Because it, my mind is, I, I am supposed to be taking care of my family, my friends, whoever, and not, I'm, I'm staying in this, this space where I'm free, right, free, although I'm not allowed to leave, free to go. And I, what happens to my child? What happens to my kids who have to go to school? Who is taking care of them? So it, it messes up my mind. You see, this is where I was going to curse for that instance, right? It messes up my head, and it destroys me physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So we do not want to go there. What we need to do is to create a, 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 the landscape, the environment, so that ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the, the enforcement body in America, so that it cannot work. In. So in New York City, what we did is we organized, we, we pushed. We, every time someone saw an immigration officer, we would mobilize the community to, to make them, to rally around this a deportation officer and make them uncomfortable. When we make them uncomfortable, they will not be able to come into our communities and act. We will block them. We would, well, I mean, we, we, we would make it very difficult for them to act. And if, when we do that, when we do that, if we say that, hey, this, the Tony is needing sanctuary, uh, normally we would put them in a, in, in a sanctuary in a, in a house of worship. But instead we say, hey, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, we are now working with Tony, who is going to be under our, our protection. Uh, we are letting you know that we are, we, you know, we, he is here with us. That, uh, that immediately puts them on notice and let them know that we have thousands of people who are going to sign up for Tony, right? And therefore, we, because of that, they didn't have to go in sanctuary. I have, we have had many cases like that where they, we didn't have to go. It makes it so much more easier for us to, to for us to fight our um, for for the person's case as well as to change the landscape. So first and foremost, relationship, right? And relationship is hearing Adam speak about his case. Relationship is talking to the people who are going through this, who are living through that channel. But I want to point out something here. When you start the pro se clinic that we talked that that um, Noria talked about, it, it is volunteers, U.S. citizens working with people who have need to put in asylum application. There is there is transference of, of trauma. It's a trauma transfer. It, it, the problem, I your problem, you have to also consider. White people have never really lived through this trauma, so it is double traumatic for them because it it now starts the the, the consciousness. The conscience actually start to, to, to challenge it. And, uh, and sometimes it actually works against us because they tend to like, oh, no, I can't deal with this. And they, rather than, so they, what we have to do is we have to be able to create not just a safe space for our community, but for people who are living this through this trauma, but for the people who are going to learn of this trauma and build a, a, a space where we, we are able to, to um, to, to move forward on where we need to be. No? Yeah, thank you so much. That's incredibly powerful. Um, and as a kind of through line that I feel I'm hearing through the three of your commentaries is that, you know, sanctuary can be a means to an end, but it's not certainly the only way or even the first line of defense. And in fact, if we want to strengthen our communities and be able to effectively challenge racist, um, you know, racist and colonial police structures, immigration enforcement, we have to be in relation with one another. We have to build communities. You know, um, Adam was talking about self-organized safe spaces. Um, I think that that's absolutely paramount. And so I think, again, this tension is alive in the sense of, you know, wanting to both work within certain structures that, for whatever reason, are respected for, you know, several problematic reasons are respected because of the hierarchies that have been instilled in our political systems, but at the same time, building coalitions that serve to hopefully 
you know, elide those hierarchies, building community spaces in which relation is the axiom around which that kind of organizing happens. And so um, I, I think that that's really compelling. And, you know, something that is on my mind, um, given the kind of conversation we've had so far, which has fallen a little bit to the background, and, and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts about this, is the role of faith, you know, writ large or just on its own terms. Like we've talked a lot about faith institutions in terms of how they're positioned and what they can do, what alliances with those institutions look like, what white saviorism in those institutions look like. And, you know, and you talked about how churches need to also realize that in a way, you know, they're being played by the government to not be complacent with that kind of, um, you know, quote unquote, respectful relationship that has been institutionalized. Churches also, you know, must recognize that they're, you know, they're being played in a sense. But the question I have is, you know, each of you, um, you know, I'm thinking specifically, Ravi, your work you describe as a multi-faith work, um, and, you know, you're a reverend. Uh, Adam, you were in church asylum. What is the role of faith within, but also beyond these institutions in, our, in articulating a vision for justice? Is it central to your articulations of justice? Is it not? I'd be really curious to hear more about this. And um, anybody can go. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to call on anybody in any order. I'll start with a quick comment. Um, Adam said it actually because. Um, it, when you talk about immigration or migration on the whole, um, you, it is so divisive that it's you're either for it or against it. There is no middle ground. And, you know, we cannot see a middle ground because it's so divisive. Um, but pe people of, when you, when you are going into a house of worship, um, you, are, you have to listen and you have to respect the, the faith leader, right? What, what I mean is that it is the only way for us to start changing the dialogue is coming at it from a, a, a person of faith, from your, the scriptural and uh, spiritual aspect. Um, whether people agree with you or not, at least you're planting the seed of that conversation that will be, that could blast, could, could bloom into something that is much more um, welcoming. I, uh, so I, I will stop here and pass it to the Reverend or um, Adam. Um, yeah, I think it is it's really important uh, in this point itself. Um, when, I, when I'm talking now, I'm already uh, all the time talking in um, a situation was uh, in Germany, and in the last years we had kind of um, biggest movement where um, I don't know if uh, all of the audience here remember that 2014-15 was a big um, amount of refugees from Syria coming. To Europe and in that time where um, Angela Merkel uh, is coming and saying and showing that um, welcoming refugee and said yeah, we can open the border for them uh, we can do that and encouraging um, the citizens of Germany to welcome the people and so on um, we had in this situation uh, both negative positive point uh, in in that scene what's happening and I think it's important in this context to see it because uh, we, we're talking here about, about safe space uh, and, and how this space is safe is. Uh, and in my mind, it's, it's coming all the time this question, after, um, after encouraging the people to do something, the, the, the German citizen to do something, uh, it show up direct uh, in uh, German political uh, one um, political party who is really racist, uh, he is uh, called AFD, like alternative for Deutschland. You know? That that happening in the same way, where is um, this, then it is the whole Germany being not safe space anymore for migrants, it's being not safe anymore, not only the judge, the whole Germany, because in in the year after that, 2015-16, is more than uh, 2,000 shelter of refugee being uh, put in fire by this right wing. Then we we had the situation we are moving from, not talking about just safe space in George, where where George can just hold some hundred of people. We talk about how this not self organized and not giving the people uh, the right for themselves to talk because these people I remember that they do march from um, uh, I think from 
from from from uh, Greece and, and different other states. They make a march and they call it March of Hope, and they organize by themselves to cross border. And 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 then the pol the politician in 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 whole Europe feeling uh, that biggest um, pressure from self organized, and then. Uh, come Merkel and, and say that we can open the border and we'll come then and encourage the citizens. And I think this is this is important to see um, what self-organized uh, can be and what self-organized can done and what self-organized can change. And in the other side, you can see uh, then the voice of self-organized being uh, pushed away by by, by, by by the citizen who have a privilege. They can say, oh, we do that and we do that. And then there, there, the, the safe community organized being only uh, put in the way to uh, like what I call it in Germany is like um, uh, a lot of people trying to do something to feel good. And then in the same time, the other people, they just waiting for having uh, this help and they don't do anything for themselves. Like they, they put down uh, by this big act of, uh, of privileged people. And um, this also we can, put it in the same way where is Jerich Asylum now working in Germany, because uh, in Germany we have uh, biggest part of people who is not giving um, status and also not being let to stay in the, in the process of asylum. And they give them just one paper, they call them uh, tolerance, or they give them, they call it in Germany, duldung. Uh, and these people, they are not being allowed to be deported because they don't have a paper to be deported. But also in the same time, they are not allowed to do anything in the country. They're not allowed to work, they're not allowed to study, they're not allowed to do different things. And for example, this is the big amount of people and they are not being uh, safe and put from the street to the judge. And I'm, for me, that is, I'm, so I, I'm, I'm questioning um, why it is the biggest number of these people who is clear that they need this help if it is being about help and being about uh, giving them space a safe space and it's, it's not happening. Um, then for me, as um, I have this experience where, where 2012 and 2015 were in the street where uh, we organized by ourselves, we are every day uh, present and, 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 and the politicals and, um, and also the, the state see us, they are there and we are demanding our right and presenting ourselves was more, um, more success uh, to, uh, to reach something and by, by ourselves to put new way of self-organize. I think this is this something is important uh, just to recognize and see um, just let's say um, giving advice to think about uh, if it is Jerry Asylum is open uh, to have people who have this experience to be self-organized inside and not just leave it to the white uh, privileged people to organize Jerry Asylum. If it is possible, I mean, that's, that's something also I would like to throw in this um, discussion here and, and see that because if we're talking just about uh, we ourselves organize uh, and, 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 and then we talk about them, they need to do something, we not come to the point because I see uh, Ravi is also saying something really important that can we discuss with even the, the, uh, the right wing? For me, I, I cannot discuss with the right wing anyway. It's just, for me, it is something cannot be. Uh, for me, the right wing is clear. They have this more dangerous for me than, than to go and discuss with them. But um, do we also have the chance to discuss with the structure of, of white self uh, guilt asylum to have self-organized inside in the way of not having uh, the structure of church asylum to decide who can come in and who can come out, but the community of migration and refugee to say, yeah, I think this person needs this and this, and we can do this, and how we do it more uh, in self-organized and, and, and keep uh, more space for more people. Because I think in Germany, there's not more than 300, 400 cases in the year. And um, in the other side, there's a lot of people who fighting by themselves for uh, stop deportation and there's a success to do that. And I can imagine if they, we put the post power in one place, can be different to think about it uh, as asylum. 
Yeah, um, and I want to give you a chance to jump in if you had something to say. If not, that's fine. Um, I just wanted to um, give another note about translation since people have been coming in and out. Uh, für die Dolmetscherinnen wäre es hilfreich zu wissen, ob jemand die deutsche Übersetzung nutzt. Uh, wenn Sie auf Deutsch hören, schreiben Sie bitte eine kurze Nachricht in Chat. Um, and did you have something that you wanted to um, jump in with or? Yeah, yes, actually, thank you. And and it's um, reflecting, I think, both of what Ravi and Adam have both shared that I'm that I'm sitting with and and then and your question of like what is the role of, of faith? What are the resources within faith traditions? And then I realized I'm actually I chose this shirt today. Um, this is an icon of Mother Mary, and there are words around the icon from the Magnificat from her uh revolutionary song in uh, the gospel of Luke. And at the top, the top quote is cast down the mighty. The whole quotation there is cast down the mighty from their thrones. And what we see in, in her song um, that, uh, that so many of us love is, is actually the changing of structures. When we're talking about casting down the mighty from their thrones, we're talking about restructuring the world so that there are the conditions in which everyone has what they need to thrive and to flourish and to be safe. And um, for me, when I, when I read our scriptures, when I read our sacred stories, that's what I see. The concern of the divine is to assure that we have the conditions in which everyone can thrive and flourish and have all that we need and be safe. And the ways that we do that is not through oppressive structures, it's not through kings, it's not through empires, because all of those things are toppled by the divine and by people who self-organize to protect their communities and do their best to assure that those conditions at least exist in, in certain spaces, if not everywhere. And what has happened in the, in the, in the white Christian church is that those stories have been turned to become victory stories of empire and to support colonization and division um, and the, the supremacy of whiteness, even for progressive and liberal white churches, this is still the way our stories and our theologies function. And because we have um, a, uh, like the, the wrong power analysis of what's happening in the text, when eventually this, this the, the, the community of Jesus becomes, you know, the, the, the people of the Roman Empire and the Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire. Those stories can no longer mean we are trying to figure out how to exist and survive and maybe even thrive in the context of Roman colonization and genocide of our people, which is the stories that we are given in, in the Gospels and in and, and, the text of, of Jesus' life and the community that, that formed around him and, sur and survived him after his execution. Once we get our power analysis straight around what's happening in these stories, um, uh, that then it becomes so much clearer to, to, to me, and I hope to many, that these are resistance communities, that these are people self-organizing to try to counteract that power, to, to use Adam, your language. And so those of us who, who are white and in these traditions can, can locate ourselves among that community that's self-organizing to cast down the mighty from their thrones, because that's actually collective liberation. That is actually what is gonna get us free. And that is actually what the divine wants for us. Not power over but communities in which everybody has shelter, everybody has food, everybody has access to healthcare, everybody is safe, everybody is cared for, everybody is loved. That's, that's, that's what we find. Um, some of that work, I'm gonna put a link in the chat for our folks, we do on the podcast that Surge Faith does um, called The Word is Resistance. Where, so if you wanna get kind of more of that kind of perspective on the text where we're trying to offer an anti-racist, anti, -racist, anti colonial anti um like countering anti-semitic readings of the text you can check out our podcast and actually get get more of that there um no i guess one of the springboard what of what i just said and what adam mentioned earlier we we have to when we talk about 
changing the system on, on anti-racism, on anti-colonialism. Um, we, as I said earlier, migration is safe. So our discussion shouldn't be only um, saying asylum and that people should be qualifying for asylum, right? If we have this free um, free flow of, of peoples across, you know, borders is a, a man-made thing. It, it, it is, it is, there's no real border. So it, uh, um, it's, it's virtual. And therefore, why do we need to have, why should we build, why should we have this uh, restriction? Now, understanding that restriction is only for people, you know, food, food and trucks and commerce and corporations, especially corporations and money travel across borders without any, any restrictions. And we, the people who it's instead should have been able to move freely, should be doing that. So, uh, yes, we, we are, we are uh, talking about asylum, but we have to broaden our conversation, say that everyone should be, should be allowed in. And, you know, we, people will say in New York, America, the open borders, but there is open borders example. Look at the EU, European Union, those 24 countries that open its borders. And, you know, you don't have everyone fleeing to, um, to, to England or France. People stay where they are, but they could travel back and forth um, according to what their needs are at that time. No? Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm so happy you brought up the arbitrariness of borders, you know, the fact that they're man-made, they're constructed, they're a product of historical processes. And actually, I very much had a question of, about borders and, you know, the boundaries of inclusion and exclusion for all of you. you in the second panel, I'm not sure if you were all able to attend um, the second panel in the series, but there was a fantastic conversation about the externalization of the U.S.-Mexico border and how the U.S. government has made it more and more difficult to even reach the U.S. border because it has, you know, cooperated with Mexican authorities to increase policing, you know, um, throughout Central America and to make it really difficult to even, not even to get from Mexico to the U.S but to get to Mexico from other Central American countries. And so the externalization of borders was a, a topic that came in. And ever since, you know, we've been talking about um, how to operate within the boundaries of confinement, how to protect people. I've been thinking very much about the internalization of borders and how, you know, sanctuary itself can be thought about, um, like if you'll entertain this thought as a process where a border is made within a colonial border. You know, people are going to be expelled from the colonial border and then a, a space of shelter or safety is made within that space. And it's often called a safe space. But I wonder about the extent to which that space can be just as constraining as the border that is external to it. Um, Adam was talking a little bit about how, you know, church asylum or asylum in general, um, sanctuary more broadly, can be can end up being a process in which there are still certain mandates about who can come in and who can come out, who's deserving deserving of protection, who is deserving of safety? Is this somebody I want to advocate on behalf of? There are deserving and undeserving migrants. There are some people who deserve the protection of the state, and that's why faith institutions and other community organizers get involved, and others deemed, you know, not worthy of inclusion. And so how do you think about that in terms of the activist work that you do? How, how do you make those determinations? And I'm sure they're difficult ones. You also have to choose your battle. You have a finite amount of energy. Definitely, Ravi, in terms of what you're saying um, um, about building relations with people, you definitely build up certain capacities such that you're not so limited in who you can protect and who, who you can you know, build coalitions with. But I'm very interested in this idea of an internal um, you know, sphere of protection, whether or not you want to call, call that the internalization of a border or otherwise. Um, how do you grapple with those kinds of dynamics in your work? One of the things this is uh, this is Anne. Um, what one of the one of the things that Surge Faith works on is, is on abolition and on um, working with congregations to uh, to actually end our reliance on police in in the United States. And and in doing that work and in learning, um, for me, it's become. Uh, much clearer the 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 intersections of of criminalization of migration um, 
regardless if someone is coming through an asylum process or, or an undocumented process crossing a border, um, but the, the criminalization of migration and who is deserving and undeserving is so deeply tied into Christian theologies of, of, uh, of morality, um, of who is good and who is innocent, um, how we define bodies and make meaning out of bodies, um, and, and missing the ways in which uh, legal structures limit people's options to survive and the choices that people have to make in those conditions. And so, um, and you know, we face this sometimes in Denver where churches didn't want to uh, bring someone in for sanctuary if they, you know, had a criminal record, for example. I'm like, why? Is this person less deserving uh, than, than someone else? And so trying always to, to kind of push back against that, um, uh, that kind of bordering, that, that policing of borders that we do to one another and really trying to understand the, the systems in which people are moving and having to make decisions about their lives um, and, and the ways in which those systems are, are constricting the choices that people are able to make. You know, well, I had to forge a document in order to be able to feed my family. Well, good, that's, you know, like fine. The system is what has made those choices to be nearly impossible. I had to cross the border back into Mexico to visit my mother who was dying with the possibility of perhaps never seeing my children again. And when I came back, I got picked up by the border patrol. It's the system that made those choices impossible. And to be consistently naming that and the ways in which white Christian theology is, is also informing the, the morality around, around who is worthy and who is unworthy and to, to be constantly pushing on that and to, to keep us focused on, on the systemic and structural issues that are at play. So I have a criminal conviction, which I just mentioned. <clears throat> and, um, it is very public, right? And I don't say what it is because even within the criminal sphere, you're, oh, you didn't commit a violent or you didn't do this, or you didn't do that. BS, right? You know, you all are constraining me. I really wanted to curse a lot, but you're constraining me. Anyhow, um, so, so um, the, you know, you, uh, you, you, you frame your question about who, how do you limit your, because you have limited resources, who, who, who do you accept or not? We, the work I do, we accept everyone. We don't care what country you're from, what language, uh, what, where, where, what, what's your criminal background or not? Um, because it makes it so much easier for me to, to say, hey, um, Jose, you, um, I will work with you. Now, the thing is, when we work with people, you, you can take different strategies for each individual. It is not always the same thing. It's not always about going out on the, on the street um, um, protesting for Jose or Maria. It is not about that. When you have set the the, the, the environment, the landscape, uh, the, the, the space that ICE knows, that Immigration Customs Service knows that if they come to this particular area, they are going to be faced um, a large, angry community. They will not come into that space. Um, so what, what you are coming back to, the, 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 the way we do this, um, we have actually use the, the white supremacy, white racist power structure against itself. So what we have done is um, partnered U.S. citizens, white citizens, with someone who has to go in like myself or like Adam who have to go into immigration, and we have the white people going there with us, right? Now, what is a key to that there is that we are not just accompanying me. We have trained people on what it means to do the accompaniment, how to respond, how to act what to say, what not to say. The most key element to what the work we have, our, what we have trained people is how to shut up. Now, these are church people, right? Uh, right? Anne is already know where I'm going with this. You can't shut church people up. But the, the key of training is how to shut up because that's very powerful because it, it ties into the faith question you asked earlier about what is our role of faith is we are witnesses. The witnesses is a key component to the faith movement and changing this. Now, you have this white, white power structure coming into the space. You know, we have, I have always described the accompaniment program as civil, you're doing civil disobedience, radical civil disobedience 
every time you do that because you are going into their space, making them feel uncomfortable, looking into their eyes and saying, hey, I am watching you. I don't want Ravi to be deported. And I am going to stand here for with that in mind. And that has, that has in fact, challenged uh, New York City, challenged them, and it has become a lot you know, I use this example, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I will say it's true, right? Um, in New York, in America, every because of the pandemic and the quarantine, uh, people, all the office, offices had to shut down. But they started to reopen back in September last year. Everywhere the federal buildings were open except New York City. Except New York City. Why is that? Because of the how we have made this space such a a community space, such a large advocacy for our for the, the, the immigrants that they, they are afraid to open. And that's what we need to do, make them afraid to act in the space even as we fight. I'm gonna make one 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 last point about you know um, when you talk about these these white supremacists and these um, immigration officers, uh, it is based upon white women. We have to save white women. Let's be real, you know, and Matilda you know, everyone, you just have to you bump against the person and boom, you're being slinched and, and body cut up, saving the white woman. Oh, white woman. But guess what happens when we have white women accompanying people and into that space? You, you challenge the ICE officers now, the immigration officers. Oh, with, with these women who we are supposed to protect, we are our G.I. Joe kind of, oh, my uh, um, hero type thing, are now challenging us. You mess with the heads. Right. So the, 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 what you have to do is to start looking at the all the different ways we can influence somebody. And it's not always a protest. It's not always on the street. It's not a petition. It is not the elected officials. It is about what we can do individually to, in, to engage in that space. And there are lots of ways we have to put our heads together and we have to create that space and that creativity so that as the agency of, 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 of us speaking up about it, we need to engage the others around us to, to work with us um, in that space. Um, I think I also can uh, put some thought about that here. Um, um, first, I think it is important to say that um, good, uh, from my point, I see it is good that Jerusalem uh, Asylum exists anyway, uh, because then they have this kind of um, line where they can uh, have contact because uh, here in Germany, for example, they have a contact direct with the immigration office where they say, okay, this person we have in uh, is this, yeah, now is to stay in our community. You can not take him back and so on. You have to work in his case and and some kind of, of things like this. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of how uh, they get access to there. But I mean, we need more to uh, make the work they do more radical. Um, I agree also uh, with uh, Rafi when he say uh, that people come and go with other people to some office and 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 and, and push and push try to push that more forward. Um, but I'm I'm going back to my idea before that um, I mean it's it's important that to do this work together with the migrants themselves. They have this um, experience and 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 go through it and then come to the point where they can also comply other people and go and discuss and do these things. I think it is it's important uh, to, to, to see and figure a way how, how to involve these people. Like, um, as I say, as, as Ravi we say already, it's, it's, it's so um, have biggest impact when someone who is already with this experience who go with some other people and comply them and so on. And then this is uh, something that you have to break this kind of uh, isolation, uh, white racist system in in the immigration asylum system, uh, because um, at least in Germany, as I I, I see, uh, it's it's so difficult uh, to deal with them uh, in this way, and there is there is a chance. I mean, there is this, it is a still a small chance, but this is a chance. It's important uh, to to use and try to involve other people. Um, let let let's say can be possible uh, in 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 the future. But uh, for our works, we do now. I think we organ we think about uh, whether we focus more in uh, in community uh, work because because for us at end uh, is more important uh, that 
people themselves to uh, feel confidence to react against their deportation because if you need uh, to go more uh, to stay, I think, to get something or status to stay, you need to, to see that in the way of it is my problem and I can deal with my problem more than waiting for other people to help me to do it. And uh, that's what we are focusing in that to give this word to say to people it's important that to organize yourself, organize yourself in your shelter you live in, organize yourself in your city, you live in, organize in, uh, with your community first, and then you can act together against, against, against deportation when it is trying to happening, or also you exchange experience of, uh, of how to stop deportation, because it's, it's important uh, that people by themselves uh, understand how the system works. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people, uh, especially in, in Germany, it's so difficult that people uh, understand this point because it's, it's bit, they put also in isolation system where isolate them in spaces, shelter out of the city, out of the city. And that also makes this um, idea of people reach them and try to support them is so difficult. And then it's, it's in, this, in the first point, it's important that they learn by themselves how to organize themselves how uh, to resist ferries by themselves against uh, deportation if it's deportation come. And then uh, they can uh, use other uh, structure if other structure is, uh, is possible to use. I think this is really important and the most work we do and we try to do it in community ferries because the community is more easy that people uh, trust each other also in community more than uh, than reliable in other structure is, uh, is already exist. Um, this is uh, something really important, especially in uh, in even how uh, what to say when you go to the immigration office. Uh, if you have this uh, letter coming from immigration office and written in it, yeah, uh, you have to show your, yourself next week, and you don't have uh, possible papers. That mean okay, you have to don't show yourself in the same point in the same time or you need to uh, show with some other people because some other people have to be in support of that. And this all information that if you are not um, giving it through the community, it's, it's difficult to be to be used and difficult to be trust if you if you don't do it in this way. Um, and also then we build political um, pressure from that community work that the community by themselves do political work who is uh, belong to their uh, political of their country. Because we talk in the beginning of, of this panel about why people even flee their country. Eh? And this is a political point we need also to combine together with uh, political discussion and political work. Uh, these people ask for asylum. What is asylum? Asylum is about people fleeing uh, because of problem, political problem or other problem. And who cause of this problem? Uh, then you need in this community where you work with them, they need also by themselves to do political work with belong to their topic of their country. For example, I'm working with the people coming from Sudan and we had a long, long fight about what, um, what a kind of help was Germany giving to our uh, dictatorship. Uh, what is European Union uh, do also with the topic of uh, migration, for example, uh, with our country, for example, uh, Germany and European um, Union have um, 2014 have one deal uh, with um, country like Sudan, Egypt, and, and, and Eritrea and Ethiopia to, um, to push the borders from Europe to Africa, where people stop the people before entering. Uh, uh, and, 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 and they do this deal with a way of supporting police border in this country, Sudan and, and other different country. And from that point, we start politicals organized to talk about this deal and what this consequences of deal is, uh, has to do with the people there. And, if it is solution that people have to be stopped from there, what is about freedom of movement uh, is exist in Europe and all European citizen, um, they, um, they enjoy this, um, this freedom of movement. At the same time, they try to, uh, to, to protect themselves and, and make the freedom of movement of people in Africa more or less to make more borders there and people cannot go from country to other country in Africa without visa, but in the same time, and, and this all political discussion who is also can bring the topic, not only in the political way more, 
extreme uh, big, but also brings this uh, point between European citizens and migrants more closer because also they have to reflect about their own privilege they have. They have a pass, they can go to all European country, but at the same time, their country pay money for a dictatorship in Africa that, that people cannot move free in the African continent. And this, this was also something was um, happening and helping to build Russia and also build political um, uh, um, understanding also with the communities of refugees to say, to say okay, this is your right also to, to resist against your deportation because in the same times uh, you see what, what kind of political uh, European politician do, uh, and that that does the work we do. I think it is also important to to connect all this political community, self organize and political work together, um, and also see what kind of existing um, power that uh, that giving or a privilege that giving uh, here in Europe. We also talking about and all this political discussion. We talk about not just in the border who is pushing. The African continent and, and so on. We talk also about the, 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 the privilege of the past of the German citizens. What does that mean when German citizen can go to 155 countries without visa? And what does it mean that when someone who living 20 years here don't have a visa? Uh, what does it mean that German citizen can go back to, everywhere to Africa and being seen as expert? And, 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 and when refugees or migrants come to Germany and being seen as refugees. All this discussion is, is, is like uh, putting uh, more understanding of the both sides, uh, because if we, if we, are, we are not coming, uh, we cannot come closer if we don't see uh, what is mean, uh, what is mean your privilege to me, and what is mean that I'm living here with you and you are not seeing uh, what, what that means. It's also important things also to discuss about what is, um, what what is uh, what is the role of the citizen of the country or European Union uh, because they have a right of voting, whereas refugees and migrants they don't have a right to vote, and and this means that they are creating the political uh, atmosphere now we have. Uh, they are giving the right or giving the power to the politician, and then this politician decide about this topic of refugees. Um, this kind of, 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 of discussion about what is mean your power, what is mean your vote to me, and all these things, it is um, brings this kind of understanding. And I'm talking about um, all this kind of, um, yeah, story, uh, taxes you, you pay, uh, the taxes you pay and all these taxes going taking from the uh, state to be giving to the dictatorship in Africa to make more control. What does all that also mean? It's, it's, it's like a big of, big of discussion that you need to reach it in a way of giving the voice for the refugees and migrants by themselves to talk about why they are here and what is the European or the, the, the country they live in, what uh, political have to do to deal with their country and what that all mean of them and then of the situation also of, uh, of the refugees in the, in the same land. And this is all, uh, I think, uh, important to link it. And that's how we, we, we do the work uh, in this way. Yeah, thank you so much, Adam. Um, and to all of our panelists, I'm really eager to open this up to Q&A because I'm sure a lot of people would like to jump into the conversation. Um, in doing so, please do use the Q&A function. Of course, if it's not working, you can use the chat, but um, I'll be monitoring a little bit more closely the Q&A. So um, please feel free to pose any questions to our panelists. We do have one question to start us off um, from Susan Smith. Um, she asks if anyone has experience with anarchist-run shelters and places of sanctuary. Uh, she says, for example, I've heard of one in Athens that was completely egalitarian until the government shut it down. Um, so does anybody um, want to speak to that? Mm, I can say I am, it's not really it's an anarchist to places, but I think it is an anarchist way for organizing that I talked before about um, uh, burger asyl, and that was like uh, activists, uh, they put themselves together and say, we need to open this um, way of giving a safe space or giving shelter for refugees, not to be just done by um, religion institution like church, but we need everyone who feel themselves in solidarity with refugees and have space 
to do that to organize it and what they done is like they are um try to collect um info how to deal uh, with the situation if you have a uh, space uh, how to give it and they are trying to organize the communication and um, between the people who need the space and uh, the people who offer the space. And at the same time, try to organize uh, some kind of um, lawyers and, and different way of helping where, where this process can come to end with, with, um, with success. I, I, I see that as a as, as big jump uh, uh, in the structure, especially in Germany, when you, when you see that people, uh, if, if because they, they also in Germany there is a law where you where if someone uh, try to hide one person who is supposed to be deported can be facing jail and I think uh, that was something to see it is more uh, radical to do and more to try to uh, radicalize this work of uh, of church asylum and I think this was a good example I think this example is still exists in Germany in different city um, I had. Uh, last two years, I had to work with um, this group of church asylum. Uh, this is uh, Burger Asyl in Berlin. They call them there, like citizens uh, at sea. They call themselves uh, in Berlin. I do with them last two years workshop about self-organize and how to um, to reflect their own structure and and so on and how to uh, open the structure more to include refugees because they also. Uh, have migrants with them. They have uh, people who is already uh, migrated or with a migrant's background, but they still have safe status and they also try to help in that. And I think uh, that uh, interesting example uh, that I, I, I lived in Germany for last years. I would add um, here in the United States, I don't have experience with, with anarchist run shelters and kind of given the, that sort of tenuous um, agreement, if you will, it's not really agreement. The thing I named earlier where um, immigration enforcement won't go into churches and that gives them a little bit more churches, a little bit more uh, congregations, a little bit more protection. Um, I won't say that they don't exist here. In, in my experience though, of organizing on the ground for immigrant justice, economic justice, um, other, other, kinds of efforts of working with anarchists and, and anti-fascists, they often have the, the clearer analysis of what's happening systemically than, than church folks do. Um, and also experience with things like uh, running jail support, uh, mutual, building mutual aid networks, um, figuring out how to provide uh, like perimeter security for events and, and buildings that churches don't have. Um, and churches, I'll speak about churches in particular, are often very hesitant to work with anarchists and anti-fascists. And I think that that's a mistake. Um, and so what I would, would offer, um, it's not exactly a response to the question, but those partnerships are actually really important um, because of the experience and the analysis um, that anarchists bring to, to our movement um, that churches don't necessarily have. So white congregations kind of need to get over ourselves of, of our like our middle classness, for example, and make those partnerships that actually stretch us and make us uncomfortable. Um, especially in our context where it is the congregations who kind of have a little more space to, to operate in terms of offering, offering shelter and, and sanctuary. Um, th those partnerships are actually really necessary and, and, can, work, and can work well. I don't have a label for um, the anarchist or anti-fascism. We anti-fascists. We will all work together, and people join different committees as they see fit or as they need to. What the, my my answer to the question is: um, we we create. Uh, we we don't need to ask people to go into someone else's home or house of worship. What we have created is like a safety net, um, which is. Rapid Resource Network, which is mobilization. So you have a way to communicate quickly to someone who is facing deportation, as well as someone who wants to fight that deportation of this person. So if ICE comes knocking on a door, for instance, sorry, immigration comes knocking on the door, for instance, um, 
one of the things you do is teach the the the, the community the immigrant um, not to open the door, right? So you have to understand the laws. You have to understand how to work within that law because yeah, we we uh, many people. I'm, I'm sure Anne will be happy to go to jail, but if everyone goes to jail, there will be no one else to protect us, right? So we have to be smart about what we are doing, um, and we don't want anyone to go to jail. We re- but we don't. We still want to fight immigration. So training our um, immigrant population on what to do if ICE comes knocking on the door, what intentionally to delay or to stop them so that we can mobilize the community. Mobilizing the community is, is the reverends and the pastors and the imams and the elected officials. You see how I bring in the elected officials there, the media, but more importantly, the people on the, who are living around this person who can, can surround that um, ICE vehicle, immigration vehicle, or surround that building so that they are not taking that person away. Um, that is how I would answer the question in terms of um, the radicalism of this, um, and, and we don't want we uh, create the, in creating the space. They cannot shut us down because it is all organic. It is all happening. It is it is building uh, because everyone is is part of this community. Yeah, thank you all so much for those reflections. Um, this has been an unbelievable panel. Um, I've learned so much in the short time that we've had together. I learned so much in our preliminary organizing meeting. Um, as I said then, um, yeah, there was just so so much that you know was discussed then and now that will definitely stay with me, and I'm sure will stay with many of our participants. Um, and we will keep the conversation going. And so Ulrike has dropped in the chat the link for our Friday discussion, um, and I'll now hand it over to her for um, some final announcements. Before I put away all your spotlight videos, I really want to thank all of you, including you, Noor, uh, for today's conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the participants uh, who are still with us. Um, I'm posting you a link to a Padlet I created where you can find information on all the speakers and all their organizations. Uh, and not, like not only this webinar, but also the first two webinars in case you missed them. Um, also, you can put some questions or some topics you would like to discuss in our network meeting on Friday. Friday's meeting it will be at the same time, 1 p.m. New York time, 7 p.m. German time, uh, and we will, or you, Central European time, I'm sorry, especially for the Austrians who are here today. Um, on Friday, we will try to... Um, to join in a meeting, not a webinar, which means that we can all have the possibility to um, put our video up and um, join the discussion together. And I'm really looking forward to this. Um, thank you again. And I hand it over to you, Anne, um, for some final words for tonight. Um, and also, I want to give special thanks to Josephine and Sarah once again, who managed to uh, interpret um, the whole event into German. And um, I guess that this was of great benefit uh, to many of us. So thank you for that to the two of you. You can't answer back because you're stuck in the translation chat. But <laughs> so and I give the word to you and um, thank you and already bye from me. Um, I was asked to offer a closing blessing uh, for our time together today. And so just with the deepest gratitude to, to each one of you, um, thanks to all the participants who have, who have been on today. Thank you, Ravi and Adam, for sharing your stories and to Noor for the wonderful uh, moderation of our, of our conversation today. So let us receive this this blessing with deep gratitude and even a glimmer of hope as we continue to make this road by walking. I bless you forward with these words, which are a modified Franciscan benediction shared by Seth Wispelway on his episodes of our Surge Faith podcast, The Word is Resistance. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half truths and superficial relationships so that, may, so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at white supremacy and all injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, 
so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, racism, misogyny, queer phobia, war, xenophobia, COVID-19, police violence, and more, so that we may reach out our hand to comfort one another and embody solidarity until our pain is turned into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. Love and liberation, amen, may it be so. Thank you.